Today is Good Friday. It is the most sombre and most solemn day in the Christian calendar. It is a day in which we recall the sacrifice of our Saviour Jesus upon a cross, a cross of wood, much like this one. From Camperdown and Lockie Ministry, welcome to our Good Friday service. And so, as we set the scene, let us turn to the call to worship. Before your cross, Lord Jesus, we contemplate your sacrifice. While leaders played their power games, your silence put them all to shame. When facing darkness be our path, that we embrace the cross at last. There is a green hill far away, outside a city wall. That's our opening Good Friday hymn. On this Good Friday, let us worship God. There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. We may And now let us pray. Saviour of the world, what have you done to deserve this? And what have we done to deserve you? Strung up between criminals, cursed and spat upon, you wait for death. And look for us, for us whose sin has crucified you. To the mystery of undeserved suffering, you bring the deeper mystery of unmerited love. Forgive us for not knowing what we have done. Open our eyes to see what you are doing now, as through wood and nails you disempower our depravity and transform us by your grace. Amen. 
Those of you who have been following us through Holy Week this year will know that our overall theme has been the words of Jesus from the cross. Today we come to perhaps the most disturbing of all of these. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We're going to hear that now in our reading from Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. And then we'll have a reflection. The Death of Jesus From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Our reflection is simply called, Why? That huge why, held deep inside us all, or spat out occasionally, isn't an intellectual question. It's a cry of agony. There are no answers, only the waiting, the walking alongside, the being there, only the giving out of what we do not have, the love that comes as we give it. The incredible risk of love demands more of us than easy answers and pretty prayers. Why? The cry of Jesus from the cross that Good Friday echoes Psalm 22. We're going to hear that psalm now in a new musical setting, and that will prepare us for our reflection upon today's words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And why so far from my help and from my groaning voice? Oh my God, I cry by day but hear no answer. And by night but find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on Israel's songs of praise. In you our fathers had faith, and you delivered them. Unto you our fathers cried, and were delivered. And their trust you did not disappoint. a worm than a man I am despised and scorned and all who see me make mockery and wag their heads he's committed to the Lord let him deliver let him save since he delights in him but from the womb you gave shelter on my mother's breast, and since my mother bore me, you've always been my God. Be not far away, for trouble is upon me, and there is not even one to help. My bones are out of joint, 
And just like wax my heart melts away within my breast I'm so dry that to my jaws my tongue is clinging As you lay me in the dust of Just like dogs, all these evil men encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones. As they stare at me and gloat, they take my garments and cast lots to see who'll get my clothes. Yet I will tell. Your name to my brethren, and I will praise you in a great congregation. The ends of the earth will remember, and all the nations will turn to the Lord. The ends of the earth will remember. All the nations will turn to the Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So records Matthew in chapter 27 and at verse 46. What is the nature of this anguished cry from Jesus' lips? Is it a cry of abandonment? Or an affirmation of faith? Or perhaps both? These, the words of dereliction as they are often called, bring us to the very core of the meaning of today, Good Friday. A strange title in some ways, for a day in which the Saviour of the world breathes his last. These words are found in Matthew and in Mark, although interestingly not in Luke. Perhaps in writing for a non-Jewish audience, Luke was concerned of the impact of these words on his readers, so he decided to omit them. And there are three ways in which we can understand these words, three levels of understanding. As a plea to Elijah, as an affirmation of faith, and as a cry of abandonment. Let's start by considering the plea to Elijah. This was certainly how some of the bystanders at the cross understood it. <clears throat> For Jesus calls out in the Aramaic tongue, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. To those who were there at the foot of the cross and did not know Aramaic, the word Eloi sounds very much like Elijah. And it was widely believed that Elijah would appear at the coming of God's kingdom to deliver the righteous. This then is a misunderstanding by some in the crowd who think that Jesus is begging to be released from the cross and that Elijah would come and save him. Nothing, of course, is further from the truth, for it was not the nails which held Jesus to that cross, but his love for you and I. Notice, too, something slightly odd. Jesus addresses God not as Father, as was so often his habit, but as my God. And perhaps this suggests to us that while the Father's face was now hidden from him, Jesus was still very conscious of God being God. In this Jesus' darkest moment, the presence of God, while it is elusive, is not far off. A second way of understanding these words is as an affirmation of faith. In using these words, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 22, which we heard a moment ago in that musical setting. We should not think that in enormous physical pain and spiritual darkness, 
Jesus was serenely and calmly quoting scripture. But we may gain an insight into Jesus' internal thoughts if we look more deeply at this psalm. The psalm begins by describing the condition of a righteous man under assault by his enemies. And there are many echoes of Jesus' experience of crucifixion. The psalm speaks of the mockery of the crowd. They hurl their insults, shaking their heads. It speaks of how the crowd urged God to rescue the victim in verses 7 and 8. It speaks of bones being out of joint, of that desperate thirst which we looked at yesterday. In verse 15 we have, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. The psalm even mentions how the clothing of the victim is divided. So at one level, this psalm can be seen prophetically, describing ahead of time the sufferings the Messiah would undergo. But crucially for Jesus, the psalm ends with a vindication by God of the righteous man. God will listen to the cry for help. Verse 24. Those who go down to the dust of death will nevertheless kneel before God. Verse 29. And crucially, in verse 31, future generations will see this apparent disaster as a moment, a key moment, of salvation. It raises very interesting questions. Did Jesus suspect that somehow God would ultimately deliver him, though perhaps not realising that God would reverse the impact of death? I think that deep down inside, Jesus knew that somehow he would ultimately be vindicated by God. For the psalm ends on a note of triumph, with a cry of confidence. The psalm asserts that the victim is innocent and that his death is according to God's plan. And I think Jesus fervently believed this. Jesus did not, as the New Testament scholar Albert Schweitzer once stated, throw himself upon the wheel of fate and is left hanging there still. So in some ways, perhaps this is these words, an affirmation of faith. But it's also a cry of abandonment. In asserting that Jesus still held on to his faith in God, even on the cross, that should not mean that we neglect his sense of abandonment. No human being could undergo that level of suffering and torture and not cry out in utter hopelessness. So we see here the fullness of Jesus' humanity. In his life, Jesus had experienced the full spectrum of human emotions. He'd been sad and angry, joyful and happy. But now he faces the final test. Utter separation from God. And until now, Jesus had never experienced the consequences of sin. And that is what sin is, an impenetrable barrier, a wall that is so high it cannot be scaled, a darkness so deep that light cannot enter. Jesus goes in through the mouth of hell itself. Until now, he has always sensed the presence of his father, whatever happened. But now the father is absent. And the father, in seeing the awfulness of the scene, has turned God's face away. God's voice is silent. God's love has gone. The light has been extinguished. Jesus has lost the sense of sonship. Brother Ramon even dares to speculate that there is in this moment a rift in the very heart of God. 
Not only is the temple's curtain torn in two, so is God's heart. It is broken. And that is what sin does. It breaks that bond between humanity and God. So in order to save us, in order to release us, Jesus has to become a sinner in the fullest sense. Jesus has to be fully human. He has to enter the darkest of places. And in so doing, he must let go of God's loving hand. This is indeed a bleak moment. Words of dereliction indeed. But it is also a moment that is filled with hope for us. For now Jesus knows the human condition in its fullest sense, warts and all. He has entered the darkest and most awful place of hell. And in doing this, Jesus leads us out of hell and into God's nearer presence. It's only by going through it that Jesus can understand it and conquer it. And that is why today is truly Good Friday. Because now we need have no fear. Now there is no place that we can end up that is beyond God's loving reach. Now there is nothing in the depths of our experience that God has not shared and plumbed. Jesus has been into the darkest place. So that when we find ourselves there because of suffering or bereavement or illness, we will find a friend who is already waiting for us. The power of the cross is that it speaks directly from God's experience to our experience. God is with us even in the blackest of our days. And so as Fred Pratt Green wrote in his hymn, God is love and he redeems us in the Christ we crucify. This is God's eternal answer to the world's eternal why. May we, in this faith maturing, be content to live and die. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Let's hear now that wonderful hymn by Isaac Watts.
today we're going to share in some of the oldest parts of the church's liturgy. We're going to share in what's called the Trisagion and the Reproaches. The Trisagion comes from the third century and from the early church. The Reproaches come from a little later, from the sixth or seventh century, from the Gallican church in Spain. So these words that we're going to use together now, that we're going to share in, have been used on this day, Good Friday, for over a thousand years. There is a response. When I say holy God, holy and mighty, you're invited to respond, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. O my people, what have I done to thee, or wherein have I wearied thee? Answer me. I brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, and led thee to a land exceeding good, and thou hast prepared a cross for thy Saviour. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. Before thee I opened the sea, and with a spear thou hast opened my side. I went before thee in a pillar of cloud, and thou hast brought me to the judgment hall of Pilate. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I fed thee with manna in the desert, and thou hast beaten me with blows and stripes. I made thee to drink the water of salvation from the rock, and thou hast made me to drink gall and vinegar. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave thee a royal scepter, and thou hast given my head a crown of thorns. I lifted thee up with great power, and thou hast hung me upon a gibbet, a gibbet of the cross. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. Amen. Let's end with a reflective poem entitled, What Could Have Been Said? What could have been said? In the garden surrounded by friends, knowing what is coming, defence rejected, no one lost, Jesus accepted the cup that was given. What could have been said before the high priest? No denials, only truth. The Messiah questioned and rejected. Jesus stands accused and beaten. What could have been said before Pilate? No arguing, no violence. His kingdom is not of this place. Those who belong to the truth belong to Christ. Jesus is imprisoned. What could have been done? Sentenced to death. Here is the man that no earthly power could contain. Flogged and crowned, Jesus is sent to death. What could have been done? Crucified, the king of the Jews, hung from a cross, taunted, robbed, broken. It is finished. Our saviour has been killed. What could have been done? He died for us, gave everything for us. He is buried and will rise again in love for us. What can we do? Amen. What could have been said? We're going to end our Good Friday service with another Good Friday hymn, a very well-known one, O Sacred Head So Wounded. And that leads us into our closing responses.
have today a blessing or a benediction. We have to wait. We have to wait Easter Sunday for that joyous moment when Jesus says to us, peace be with you. So we end today with some closing responses. When hope has gone, we watch and wait. When darkness lingers, we seek for light. When all is hidden, we look for answers. Jesus is laid in the tomb. We go in God's peace. And we wait. Goodbye for now. <laughs>